All right, Brent Pullman, man, I am super excited that I was able to get you in here for for the Intentional Agribusiness Leader podcast, man. Um, we've I think we've known each other what at least over a decade. I think we first met when I moved to Omaha back in like 2013 or something like that. We got together at a couple of different events. So, anyway, welcome to the show, man. It's super super cool to have you on here. Great to see you, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while since I've seen you, but I, it's always the energy. It always fills the room when the two of us get in the room and we don't stop talking. I know that for yeah, a fact. Yeah, yeah, it'll be good. This is going to be great. So, Brent, everybody gets the same question at the onset of our of our interviews. So, tell me, what does it mean for you to be intentional? Be intentional. Well, you know, I think it really for me, intentionality has to come from the heart. Um, it has to be heartfelt, and I've only really discovered intentionality probably again, it took, it took something catastrophic for my mom to die, but that was really the first, really first time that I said, um, you know what? I want to be more intentional. At that time it was about my faith and that's really where the intentionality start. And then to your point, when you start using that word, it's very powerful. And when you start to realize that, you really want things that are most important to you, your your family, your friends, your your uh, workplace, the employees that work there, your clients. And you're going to do things that are going to be um, on pur- for purpose and for mission and uh, based on values. And it, it is life changing, uh, living a life in intentionality. I, I really like that word. Mm hmm. It is. I'm. I'm just curious. What's been the What's been the most challenging part about being more intentional? Since you made, sounds like you made a very conscious decision. So what's What's been the most challenging for you? I think for and you'll notice every time I hear the word, you know, I'll take a deep breath and I have to just stop and really think about that because even when you said that, I had to really stop and think about that. And it's like, and that's what it's really all about is you're stopping and thinking for a change and you're going to really act with purpose. I lived my life most, maybe you did too. I, I was so reactive, super reactive, lived on the go fast. Yeah. Might say something. I might not even hear it. I, I might deflect it. I might've heard it. Maybe not today. You know, it's just more like, wow, I want to know more about that. Or I want to be aware. Where's that coming from? Or um, I, there's such a big, I think awareness is the other part of intentionality. You grow your awareness to things so much more, but I lived most of my life react- reactively, super fast, trying to take everything in. I don't know if I thought it was a computer or what, but um, just, yeah. And when you realize that you want to act with intentionality, then relationships really rise to the top. And I think that was the key for me. Yeah. So I'm curious about this too, because you, so there, you said there was a, I mean, a traumatic event, so losing your mother and that was a, was a trigger event that caused you to become um, go deeper in your faith and become more intentional that way. Also, somewhere along this line, like you also became a CEO <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and took over uh, a company that I believe your father used to run, correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So if you were to look at, it's not really a versus, but there's two big influences here, right? There's the faith aspect. And then there's the, this, you know, leading a company of uh, how many employees do you guys have? So we're almost up to 300 now. 300 employees. Okay. So this is a large organization, you know, not, not a, not a massive, but I mean, a fairly sizable organization, um, you know, serving the, you know, the broad scope of, of agribusiness and, and beyond, I'm sure. So what, um, I mean, they did both of these things kind of take intentionality. So I don't help. Let's go deeper on that a little bit, Brent. Like what, which one do you think has influenced you more to be more intentional? Well, I think it's, I think it's everything all encompassing. I mean, there's just so mm-hmm. many things to that and that's really, um, we'll get into it, but that's really why I wrote the book. I think when you become a leader, I don't know if I knew exactly what all that meant. And like you said, my dad started the company in 75 and then I came back in 2005 and then in uh, 2016, um, his partners left. So it was, it was my dad and myself until 2020 when my dad retired at the age of 80. Wow. So <laughs> there was a lot of transition there. And I think um, along with transition, I think being intentional, you you really, um, it's transformational. You know, you can use that mm-hmm. word too. And there's a lot there, there's a lot to unpack, a lot to think about. Um, and then again, when you're intentional about it, you start to really unpack. And again, I did not know how much was really in my heart. Some of it, 
I was using some of it. I would never, I hadn't even thought about, or I wasn't really aware of. Mm -hmm. And I think it, through this whole process, again, I'm a, I'm a different person than I was in 2016 because of it. And it's for the better. And you really learn quick as a leader, you're going to either be really effective or you're not going to be really effective. And uh, that was the, probably the piece for me that through that process over the last five years, I've really learned a lot. And mm -hmm. it's taken me this to really, again, find what's in, in my heart, be intentional about certain things, other things, again, um, may not necessarily I need to spend the time on, but um, there's a lot there. We And you'll probably yeah. unlock some of those things, but there's a lot there. We could go on. Well, I've, I've spent the last eight months, as of right now, as of the recording of this, I've spent the last eight months diving deep and really just dissecting. And I, hopefully by the time this is over, I think I'll have like a PhD in, in, in what it means to be intentional. And yeah. a lot of it's just been now 14 hours of just interviewing people like you. And this is the 14th one that we've created out of the 20 part first, you know, first season. And so I'm just, I'm finding so much. And I think one of the uh, conclusions I'm coming to right now is that as you assume a leadership role, as you grow in a leadership role, and I don't, I'm not, I don't care if we're at like a mid-level management or if you're, you know, becoming the CEO of a 300 person organization, there's a part of this that shifts you and challenges you and, and causes, forces you to up level and to be intentional up, about that as opposed to shooting from the hip, right? Which is, I think when we're, when we're younger and maybe not as intentional, we tend to be, it tends to be more about us, right? It tends to be more about like, what can I do? What can I, you know, how can I make this happen? This all depends on me. In fact, I have several VIP coaching clients that I've worked with over the, the last couple of years. And the biggest challenge is these guys think it's all on them. It's all on their shoulders to make all these things happen, right? And that's a lot different than you know what I hear you talk about in your daily morning videos on LinkedIn. <laughs> so what have you learned? Like, How has your faith journey really impacted your ability to, to be intentional, to listen, and tune in and be, cause I just, from you, I get this very grounded presence. This very grounded sense is, but is what it comes through. It does. I think you have to find it. Like you said, um, I really didn't have a strong why, you know, a few years mm. ago. And, um, I will never forget. And it's in the book that it was two and a half hours. We were in a, a Uber cause our, um, flight back from Austin to Omaha was canceled. So we took an Uber from Austin to Dallas, which is a long drive. And, um, that whole time, uh, the person that was with me, Dana Berkey, who's our, um, chief strategy officer, she kept asking me, what's your why? And she wouldn't let me off the hook. And I, for two wow. and a half hours, I could not get my why out of me. And I didn't realize that I did not have a strong why, but, um, fortunately, um, I knew I had to work on that because that really does drive your intentionality with everything. And so my why and my how is I'm a person of faith who um, coaches people up and leads from the heart. And I say that every single day. And I used to think that was so silly, but it's so impactful. It really is. And it really does, as you say, it really grounds you. And every day when you start to say that and you know why you get up every morning and why you go to work and why I enjoy going to work, then um, you really, it comes together. But it really does take a strong why, I think, in the beginning to really know that. Um, I think I had a why. I think I did. But, you know, many years, I don't think it was really that strong. I don't think it was yeah. super strong. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, to, to really get clear on what that why is, um, requires that you actually take intentional time for yourself and go work on you right yeah. as opposed to just be in reactive reactive mode and or say what you think everybody wants you to say right or have the right things to say so good good on dana for locking you in an uber for two and a half hours <laughs> and like not letting you go man like how intentional for her yeah oh i know and, and you said something there i think the other key that i did not know i thought self-care was selfish for the longest Ooh, really interesting I did. I thought that was, I thought those people who took care of themselves all the time are like, who do they think it, they are? But you really, you have to, you have to have that strong foundation, even in yourself. You have to be strong physically, yeah. mentally, spiritually, uh, mind, body, soul, spirit. I mean, it all has to be strong. If you're going to, as I say, I want to bring my A game every single day and people will see it at work. If I'm down or if I'm out, I, I think I, I was sending the wrong message for many years. 
So now I make it a point to be intentional that, yes, things are good. Things are good. Things are always positive. Even regardless of what's happening, I have to show that. And people are people pick up on that so fast. I had no idea. But they also, if you think about it, do you want to be around the guy or, or uh, lady who is not, who's always down or is frowning or not in a good mood? Nobody wants to be around that type of energy either. So there's a mm-hmm. there's a real balance there, but there's also an energy bet that you give off to the other people too when you uh, just decide to be intentional about that and bring that every single day. Yeah, well, it's fascinating what you're saying. And in, in one of our programs, we teach a um, a concept, a framework, if you will, called the law of infusion. The law of infusion states that I can only infuse others to the degree that I first infuse myself. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and that's when we, uh, when we start talking and we, and we, we teach it in the context of servant leadership. So the, the old idea, the old paradigm of servant leadership is sacrifice everything you got, right? Go all in, give everything you got, take care of everybody else. And then if there's a little bit left over, then you can have some of that time, right? Yeah. That's the old servant leadership. That's our, like our mental model. That's what the world thinks about often when they think about servant leadership. And we, and we say, Yes, we're going to go all in to serve everybody else, but no, for like numero uno is you got to set aside some time to go to work on this physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, relational being that you are. You do that first, right? You, you at least block an hour at the front end of the day to give yourself some time. Like leave your phone off for the first half hour at least. Drink some water. <laughs> go for a walk, right? So. No, it's absolutely right. And it's part of a routine. I call it a routine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every morning I get up first thing I have to be either outside or I'm in the gym working with the trainer, but I got to get some physical activity first thing in the morning and, and fresh air. I love to be outside. It doesn't matter what the temperature is. Uh, as, as you know, all, all year round I'm outside. Yeah. Um, the other part of that though, I think that I did not know it's really critical is taking time to write down your wins every day. That's what I do. I mean, what, what, yeah. what, did, what did I win today? And then probably the biggest thing for me, was what I look back at the day before and I say, what was I uncomfortable with yesterday? I write it down. And the fact that I write it down has made me so less reactive because I'm taking whatever that issue is and taking the power out of it by writing it down. And then when once it's written down, I can decide now how much time, do, is this really important? I have, I spend some time, is this really important? Do I really want to bring this up? Or is this something that, I'm probably making too much of, or do I need to let it just rest there for a second and see how it plays out? But nine times out of 10, those things that make me uncomfortable later turn into wins. It's amazing Mm -hmm. that whole process, but I had to do those type of things. So I journal a lot too, um, on the, on the other side of doing the, everyone thinks of self-care taking care of your body and all that stuff. But there's also a process of writing things down and journalizing too. Um, and before I forget, I want to just say like during COVID, I'll never forget, you were one of the first people that I listened to with a podcast. You offered it free right away. And then you, because I think you knew the value of we have to keep the human interaction, to, you know, there. Mm-hmm. We have to keep our people there. And I'll never forget, you yeah. said, I don't even remember what it was, like five five weeks in a row or something that I signed up. Yeah. I- yeah. We were, uh, well, well, we were reeling, honestly. I mean, yeah. we're, we are still even for the most part now. I mean, we've always had virtual coaching. That's been for now nine, almost 10 years. We've been doing virtual coaching on the back end of our live events, but the live events had become, and this is going to sound self-serving, but the live events had become so good that our clients often didn't want to have a virtual only experience if they'd been with us. And then a lot of other companies just pulled their training dollars during that time frame. Everybody just said, nope, we're just, you know, we're going to wait until th- this whole thing is over and then we'll figure something else out. So, you know, we were going into like a re- like it did not look good and it wasn't, and it did not go well <laughs> from a business perspective. I've spent part, a lot of my journey with this, like my, my intentional journey has been making a decision on what do I get to create now? After we got to go through, you know, like an extreme up when we started this thing in 2013, it was just up and to the right. We doubled or tripled every single year until 2019. And then we started, yeah, obviously we got to go backwards quite a bit for, you know, 20 and 21, but, um, you know, the, the, we started, um, like right at the onset, we said, what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to, how are we going to keep serving 
even though we don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, what can we do? Like we got to find a way to pivot somehow and, and just see what else and, and, you know, what else is going to stick? What else, what other kind of offers? And it was out of that, that we, we found the pieces that kind of just kept the business alive enough, <laughs> like just enough over the next couple of years that we could get it back to where it is today and where it's going to grow in the next couple of years. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I I'd, uh, almost forgot that we did that. <laughs> it was huge. No, for me, it was huge because that was a really a time, like you said, you didn't know what, I mean, I had to make decision just like you said. I remember in, I think it was April or May, they said, how long are you going to keep the company open? We didn't know we were a central business at the time or how that yeah. was all the way out, but we never closed. And I remember I said, wait a second, you guys got to give me a few, I, I need a few hours to think about that. And I made the commitment that we were going to stay open until August. I just, I don't, again, I just made that commitment and, um, and we did, we, uh, we received PPP money and we didn't use a dime of that. We all gave it all back because we stayed open. But to your point, I think what, what really got me through that time was I remember your podcast and I just, uh, those times being with yourself and the other people on that call is like, this is really, you know, this is what it's all about. You have mm-hmm. to, even in the face of uncertainty, you need to be surrounded by good people. And I thought that was really, yeah. that was really cool. That was a cool yeah. moment. Yeah. And then now we've been able to uh, even expand uh, further into that with our Ag Leader Summit, which which existed pre-COVID. <clears throat> and now we're expanding it going forward. So the, it's just re- literally just a mastermind of you know people that are in roles like yours or other leadership roles from around the ag industry coming together in, in a in a space where we're meeting like three times a year uh in person and then we do calls every month we're just kind of and it's a lot of a lot of people just sharing hey vulnerably like I, this is what i'm struggling with and inside and outside of work there's really no other mastermind like it for agribusiness and that really comes from the spirit of people need to commune we got to keep people you know, getting together, we, we crave this connection as part of the intentional piece. And it's, you know, we went through a tough time. It sounds like we might potentially be coming up on another one of those tough times because of some of the forces that play in the world, which is unfortunate. And we're going to keep it going. Like we're, we're just not backing down (laughs) this time. Like this is, this is our play and this is how we're showing up and leading intentionally so that we can help others be more intentional as well. Uh, I'm just curious. I want to talk a little bit about the business. And I want to talk about the book. So with the uh, you know, at Midwest Labs, um, talk to us a little bit. What do you do? I mean, 300 people, that's a lot. So I'm sure you face all the same challenges that other businesses face from uh, attraction, talent attraction to, to turnover. What are you guys doing intentionally to try to retain great talent? Yeah, I mean, it's... It, it, Attracting great talent is tough. Um, again, we have partners that kind of help us with that too as mm-hmm. well. But I think it really hit hard for us last year with a, with the cost going crazy up. We were trying to do a lot of things. We didn't see that necessarily. People, we would we want people, obviously you're in a production, we're in a kind of a production lab. So we get many, a lot of samples. We get results out on the analysis in three to five days. And we would have people come in one day and then, hey, I'm, I'm going to take off tomorrow, but I'll be back Wednesday. I just don't feel like working on it tomorrow. I mean, that was the attitude Wow. last year. So what we ended up having to do, I've never done this. We worked with our partner and we actually, if you stayed five days in a row, you got a $50 gas card. That's how we had to do it last year. We had really? to Interesting. give that type of incentive to keep people there every single day. Now, I think through that model, what we learned through that process is we better build our infrastructure and, and we've been working on, it doesn't sound, I, you know, most people don't talk about their infrastructure, but we have been building and working on our infrastructure probably for the last four years. I always think, when are we ever going to get out of this in working on our infrastructure piece? But it's so critical. You have to have, you have the right, right people. Um, before COVID in 2019, we had 114 employees. Today we have 295 employees. Thanks. So you Look at that. We have just grown and we are breaking at the seams. We're actually in the process of moving. We're going to relocate to Papillion and we have property and we have a building there. But um, through it all, I guess on the ag side, I would say last year was our tough year. I keep thinking we're coming out of recession. I know everybody, when's the recession coming, going? When's it going to be here? Yeah, I really right. think last year was our hardest year because of all the the costs went up so fast. Oh, and sure. Mm-hmm. We had to get things in place. 
And we didn't want to react too fast because we didn't know how, how bad was this thing going to get. And you saw a lot of bad behavior last year where overnight vendors would call you and say, hey, we're going to raise your price, you know, 30%. You know, thank you very much. We've been doing business. You're gonna. That's what you're gonna tell me. I mean, that was the kind of relationships that I just thought, wow, people are really are just. It it doesn't matter. I said something has to give here. So we probably took it on the chin a little bit, and we towards the end of last year, the third and fourth quarter, we changed some things on our prices. We changed some things in the way we recruit, but it helped us become stronger. And this year, we're we're watching it cautiously, like everybody else. Some things are in, out of, in your control. Some things are out of your control. But I really think we're coming back to um, and ag people um, are the most resilient people. I would just say that the ag industry is really resilient, which really helps. But um, as far as testing and stuff, we keep getting better. I, I will just say that our infrastructure, our processes, our analysis, we are reviewing processes like we've never before. We want everything in the science to be what it is in the science and the, and the quality shows and the consistency shows. And I think our clients see that and our employees see that and they want to be a part of that. So our wins are internally and with clients, but we are really trying to get better and healthier, I think. And to use that as a model, I think that's really where people are, are kind of excited about that, that mm -hmm. we're getting healthier, we're getting better, we're getting stronger because we know more is coming. And that's kind of how we look at it. And I think from the leadership point, you've got to always point, where is this company going? Because I get asked that every single day. Where are, you, where are we going? And they don't want to know now. They want to know where is it going. And if I have any, if there's any negativity, I mean, people will feel it today. Or they'll just have to see it in the news if they go home. So um, building something that's going to be resilient, last, uh, stronger and better, I think that's where we're at really as a yeah. company. Yeah, well, that's fascinating, and it, you know, it's just interesting to hear how important the the vision is, right? Hey, here's you know, this is what's up. This is where we're going. I mean, to have to have d literally doubled more than you know, almost more than doubled your uh, your employee headcount. There there has to be some 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 greater vision, some greater use, <laughs> you know, for you. And these kind of things don't happen if you're not being, if you're not using your time intentionally, if you're not being used intentionally. If you want to uh, look at it from a spiritual context, and uh, so so, let's talk a little bit about like how has the your work, and is this something that we would find in the book? I know the book is called Leaders Look Within. Uh, so I, you know, for those people that have not led significant you know, large teams or even just like a team that would go from five to 10, that's a dramatically different setup. That's more demand on your time. Um, that's more, uh, I mean, going from one to two <laughs> employees can be a big deal or, or from not leading anybody to leading just one or two people is a, it's a different job altogether. And so I think it behooves leaders to be intentional and go take a deeper look within. So what can we find in the book? I think people should probably order this and I'm not saying that just because you're on my podcast and I'm not saying that to, uh, to, to, you know, just put a little extra frosting or a little extra cherry on this thing. Like it doesn't, you, you don't get those kind of results if something's not going well, if you're, if the leader is not doing something right. So talk to us about what we can find in the book. How is this helping you grow the business? Oh uh, yeah, no. And, uh, and again, I, the book, I'll just show it here for a second. Yep. This isn't the reason, I mean, you asked me to be on this, um, podcast to talk the book is really secondary i really want yeah. the story out and it's really it's about my it's really about my transformation particularly mm -hmm. in this whole process because i think i don't know about you but i have like thousands of leadership books here at home and all mm -hmm. over the place i have not find the right the right book that really grasped what was in a person's heart and that's where it really has to start and if you get if you unlock that i think anybody can lead whether you're at, at home whether at work whether it's your family whether it's um your workplace you're not quite a leader yet or a man, executive level or what anywhere you can lead if you just really unlock what's inside of you and really uh find the purpose and mission and drive in yourself and that's really what the book's about, because that's what I found. That's what it took, again, to have this. But I would say some of the things that the key things that happened at work that really uh, helped us grow was 
one, you have to trust your your leadership team. I mean, trust is huge. Um, mm -hmm. My uh, Dana Berkey, who runs the uh, chief strategy officer, runs the operations. She came to me and she was so um, she was so honest with me and said, "You need to get out of the day to day," and that was hard for me, super hard for me. Yeah, because I saw my dad; he was in the day to day too. It was eighty, never never left the day to day. So completely different model, uh, completely different look. But by getting out of the day to day, then, as you say, Mark, so well, you know, you got to work on your vision. You got to work on where the company's going all the time. You got to uh, be aware of what's happening around us. You can't be fixated on the numbers, the production numbers all the time or where this or an issue. You can't think that you can solve everything. You need a team to do it. And the only way you can do that is if you trust the immediate people around you and then build that level of directors. In our case, we built a level of directors of 15. So we were very flat. It was just the top and then it was everybody else. But we've put mm -hmm. some layers in there now. And uh, between directors, managers, supervisors, we had to have those levels because there was so much work to do. And that's the only way you get it when people understand their roles, their responsibilities, what they need to do to accomplish those things. Because there's so much, especially a company our size, there's so many things. And we had such a small team and we were in the day to day all the time. We couldn't we couldn't execute on those things. So taking people off the line, even to give them the leadership tools and ability to and and freedom to say, here, you need to, we need you to do this, or you need to invest in this, or get get trained up on this. If or if you have questions, that whole openness and um, modeling and sharing. I mean, it's just been fascinating to watch the growth of the company from a people side too. Yeah. So it's huge. It's huge. There's a couple of so, things I want to unpack there. Okay. The first thing you said was trusting in the leadership team, right? Yes. I think it's so, well, I mentioned this before, like so many people feel like they have to carry the weight of their company, their team, et cetera. And, and so then they don't delegate as much. They don't trust. The, the, one of the common problems as a coaching company that we help people through is, well, it's just, it, I know if I do it, it gets done right. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. How do you how do you let go of control and uh, let your team just lead? You know, I I think I think it starts with yourself. You have to re really recognize what you can do, and then even it comes down to if those things you don't want to do or you don't do as well. It's okay. You have to tell yourself that's okay. I don't have to know all the accounting books today. You know, I can get hand that off, or the computer IT stuff. There's much people people much smarter than I. Yeah. I need you to look and handle those things. You can you can keep me informed. And I think that's the beauty. Uh, I will say, um, and you talk about trust. It kind of goes, comes together. But Dan and I, we start off the day, we send a text to each other. It, we actually say, I'm praying for you. You're uh, She's praying for me. So we're both people of faith. So we both send a text to each other, start the day. And then um, we uh, at the end of the day, we we have a phone call. Our update is just a phone call and we have to leave on a positive note. We know that at the end of the day, but she gives me an update of what's happening to the whole company. And I know more about the company now than I ever did when I was in the day to day, which was huge. I can say that. So um, she has, she has taken that process and really incorporated it into all of her directors and supervisors. And she really leads the side of the people and um, hold there's accountability but there's also growth and there's a lot of freedom to do things, but we are, con we have four big goals. We used to have 30 big goals. That's the other thing. When you're smaller, you always think you have like 30 goals, but we have four major big goals and we see wins every single day. And we celebrate the wins every day. And we talk about those because I think that's important and healthy, but um, there's a lot there. I said, but the yeah. trust communication, I mean, you, you just go down the list those things come together when you um, start to find something that works for you. It has to work for you guys. Everyone's mm -hmm. different, but I've never had a person like that, that I've worked with in all my life that we really come together and have that type of uh, communication. So, okay. So the, this is super, super interesting. I'm loving that you're bringing this up and and we maybe have to just do a whole other episode later on, like just on how do you, how do you how do you have that kind of person uh, on your team? Because there, uh, there's a book I don't know if you've ever read it called Rocket Fuel 
it's part of the the, the, the e, uh, entrepreneurial operating system. Um, I think I brought it up probably at this point on several other podcasts because it keeps kind of coming through. But it makes sense. So if I'm if uh, if I'm the CEO of my company, um, uh, chances are I'm also the bottleneck of my company, right? Or if I'm the the leader of my team, I'm the vice president of sales or the vice president of marketing, and I've got a team, right? Or I'm the sales manager and I've got a team, right? Chances are I'm also bottlenecking what's possible for my team because everything has to flow up through me. Right. And so what the EOS model, the rocket fuel model basically suggests is that the, 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 the CEO usually is more like the visionary type person who's got the big, here's where we can go. This is what's possible. Like we're, you know, we're, you know, it's, it's our job to, as the CEO to go drive culture and, and you know, kind of lead from the front and say, this is what we're going to be about. Right. And then you have some sort of some sort of person, what they call an integrator, on the team, which is sound that's kind of like what uh, what what Dana is, right? For you, is this person who touches all parts of the business, and really like their job is to make the vision come true, mm -hmm. and they drive that through the organization. And when you put these two components together, as opposed to being the CEO, uh, who is in who's who's touching all of the day to day stuff. Right. That's a very, there's two very, very different vibes. And the, the one thing I wrote down as you were talking earlier, and this was the second thing I wanted to bring up is I don't have to lead like my dad did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Cause I remember meeting your dad, like at a luncheon at one point, probably 10 years ago. And I'm like, I mean, just no, no shortage of certainty whatsoever. Right. I mean, very certain knows his stuff, charismatic, oh. Right. Leads from the front kind of guy. Like nobody's going to mess with this guy. Like he is very much the alpha in the room when he's around. Right. So, <laughs> uh, but like, what, well, what if I take over for my dad or what if I take over for just any other leader that was there before me? I'm not them. And so many people get lost in trying to lead like their predecessor. And it maybe takes a little, takes a minute for them to figure out who they are. But I think there's a very intentional journey where you have to find out, okay, this is how God put me here to lead. I'm going to do this. Right, right. No, I would say that. And that that's what really the book is about, is really taking that stuff and really saying, you know what? I see why my dad did it that way, you know? And it worked back then. I'm, I'm not here to, I'm not here to criticize my dad. What he built was amazing. And yeah, I wanted to build, I wanted to actually build on his legacy. That's my goal is to build on this legacy. It's just going to look, as you say, it's just going to look a little different. It is. Right, right. And and, um, and and that's good. You and and but it's hard. It is because our predecessors, our dad, yeah, they're they're always going to constantly question, "What are you doing? What's what's going on here?" And there's a lot to be gained. And I will see the energy of the. I think the our younger people. It's just mm -hmm. it, when you embrace it and you want more of that, they will respond if they know the vision. To your point, if they know where everything's going, they will. It may look differently than than what it looked like for myself professionally, but they will grab onto it. And that's the culture we're building. And to your point, culture is really key here. And it starts with core values and having a strong mission and vision. But um, I I mean, I get excited about culture. Like tomorrow, we have our monthly town hall. You can come mm -hmm. in person or you can watch it on Teams or you can watch it later. But we are really encouraging everyone to get it make sure you get your updates, make sure you understand what's happening around the, the company so that you know what's going on. And that excitement, again, go, is, is passed on to our clients and our clients see that too. Some of the things too that I'll always keep from my dad is we'll have a live voice. You call the main number here, you won't get any number system. I, will, I refuse to have any kind of number system here uh, for a phone call, I want a live voice. Everybody wants a live, still wants a live voice. And client service, as we know, it's really, I, I'll just say it's bad. I think it's just awful. It's probably mm -hmm. gotten worse, but you'll get a live voice, always passing to a live voice. I think that's so critical uh, yeah. today, but but you're right. Everything, you got to change some things. You can keep some things obviously too, but you've got to find it for yourself. You've got to own it. I, I call it, you got to own it yourself. Yeah, and uh, know what's what's right and what the way you want to go, and um, that takes time and it takes a lot of work and intentionality to to get there. Absolutely.
Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, th- this has been fascinating. I would love to love to keep going, and we're already over half an hour uh, <laughs> on our conversation. I, I do want to throw a, get a, get a few more things in here, uh, just for resources, um, Brent. For what you know, like what I, what I love as you were just t- talking about this, I'm I'm literally picturing. Uh, my recent study through the Old Testament, I'm like, wow, like, so, you know, your your dad was kind of in that David type of role and you're kind of in this Solomon type of role. And I'm not trying to like butter you up with that, but it is, it's the, the first generation to the next generation. And so the challenge that we have now is how do we, how do we make sure, because we know that most businesses don't pass well to the next generation of whatever it is, you know, whether we, whatever happens next. So how do we intentionally leave that legacy. I think that's going to be a fascinating part of your journey. Uh, and I'm excited to just watch from the sidelines and, um, and, uh, and be a supporter and, and, and continue cheering you on. So what should we be reading? What's a good book? I know certainly leaders look within, look it up. It's on Amazon. Uh, you can get it delivered literally next day. Um, so everybody should be getting a copy of that and, uh, and see what a fellow leader in agribusiness is writing about his personal journey. But what else should we be reading, Brent, or listening to? Um, I've been so focused on the book here. You know, um, I've been reading a lot. I don't know if you know the the author, Tiffany Bova, but she's got some really um, good on the um, emotional intelligence, client service pieces mm-hmm. together. Um, and I can't think of the name of her book. It just came out. Sorry about that. But Tiffany Bova, she writes a lot. I listen to a lot of podcasts too. Um, I just really get my information there as well. So I'm probably not the person to, as far as books, Yeah, uh, as you know, my summer has been two daughters getting married and uh, I've been packed. So this summer has been moving. <laughs> you've had a lot, you've had a lot going on. Understood. Under, what's uh, what's your favorite podcast that, uh, that you have on the regular? Oh gosh. I really like the momentum podcast. Uh, okay. Alex, in, that's I was in his uh, mastermind group and I talk about that in the book too, but he's the one who really introduced me to self-care and mm-hmm. I was, it comes out once, once a week, every Friday. And um, I really like the different things he talks about being a leader. I think it applies to all industries. I know we didn't talk a whole lot about agriculture, but I, again, I would say in this uncertainty, you'd really just need to draw from yourself get to go to people that you trust when things seem weird, keep asking why that would be my advice. That's what I keep doing. Cause some things just don't make sense, but you just keep asking why. And it's amazing the amount of knowledge you can gain by doing that and finding the right people who will care. If you find those people who care about what you're talking about, you really get good information. And I think that I'd rather get my information that way than any type of media at this point. Mm, yeah, I think this this day and age calls us to really develop and lean on our powers of discernment. Yes, yeah, right. Absolutely. I mean that is the that is a spiritual gift that when developed, and I think that I think everybody has access to it. The question is whether or not you want to take time to really develop it, because uh, we it can be it's very confusing these days, right? If you were yeah. What, what was it? this YouTube channel and this media outlet and this in this radio show and this host and the, everybody's got their own take on what's happening right now and it's very turbulent. So you know the the place that I have found that we I think that we get to come back to is just leaning in on what feels really true to you, what makes you be less reactive, mm-hmm. right? What allows me, what gives me the space to be more intentional. And it's, it's not the things that keep getting me hyped up. And believe me, I go down all kinds of rabbit holes that get me hyped up. And I have to remember <laughs> to come back to my middle C, right? And like my, 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 what you talk about your morning routine, like my morning ritual over the summer, a little easier when the kids are not in school, but I'm still like, now I'm figuring out how to, how to recalibrate and still get it in. But it's like, wake up, uh, don't get on the phone, uh, drink my water, right? I get my little bottle of water. It's 32 ounces. I try to drink most of that. Then I make my coffee and then I sit down and I do my, my daily study, you know, in the Bible. And that like, when I do those three things, like within the first 30 minutes or so of waking up, I have more certainty. I don't get distracted as much. Uh, occasionally, like I'll, I'll, I will get out my phone and one of the first things that pops up will be Brent Pullman on LinkedIn with his devotional, talking it through out on his morning walk or morning run, whatever it is that you're out there doing, Right. And you guys can tune in. I, I would highly encourage you to go follow Brent on LinkedIn, get connected if you're not already. 
And uh, my wife and I talk about it all the time. Like we love when it pops up because we just go on here. I can listen. You know, here's the devotion. I don't even need to read one. I'll just listen to whatever Brent's looking at today and get his two cents on that. So uh, Brent, before we close it down today, anything else that you want people to know or places they can connect with you or, or Midwest Labs? No, I think, uh, like I said, LinkedIn, obviously you can connect uh, on the company or myself. And um, no, I, I just, I'm just grateful for you having keeping in touch and, yeah. um, and being on the show. It's great. Such great yeah. energy, great information that people really need today. They really need this. We do. We do. And that's why we're making it now. So, all right. Thanks, Brent. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, Mark.